happy. And I would like to continue by accepting <laughs> the recording. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome all our guests from across the world, uh, especially from Indonesia as always. A few housekeeping points. Uh, we are recording as you will have just seen, uh, and this will be made available along with all of our other Herb Feath um, activities on our website. And second, please do type questions into the chat box. Um, even as these come to you, uh, you don't need to wait to the end and we'll come back to those. Uh, and then third, I encourage you all to follow us on Twitter and our Herb Beef Facebook page so you can stay up to date uh, on all of our activities. Now, before introducing our special speaker for the day, I would like to turn over to Lenny who will tell us all about the fantastic uh, library resources that we have uh, here at Monash. So Lenny, thank you. Terima kasih, Sharon. Thank you, Sharon. Welcome, everyone, to the April Monash Indonesian Seminar Series. Uh, my name is Reni Pulungan. I'm the subject librarian for Indonesian studies at Monash Library. So um, I will just quickly show you uh, a couple of things that I would, um, uh, a couple of things that I think would be relevant to what we uh, we will hear today. Um, so for those of you, I'm going to share my screen now. For those of you who are not familiar with um, the Mon uh, Monash Library catalog, um, I know some of you are joining from Indonesia. You can always look at what we have in terms of um, uh, Monash Library collection from the, the catalog, which we call uh, Monash Search. So for example, if you are interested in um, reading more about what uh, Professor Ian McNiven writes, you can always try to uh, search um, with the author um, in the advanced search function. So as I as you can see here, I put Ian's name and then you'll see lots of different writings, publications from Ian. So um, that's one thing. Um, the other thing that I want to share is two library guides that we have, which are relevant to what we're going to talk. Uh, well, we go, uh, Ian's going to talk today. So the first one is um, we have Indigenous culture, Cultures and Histories Library Guide. Uh, and uh, Ian is part of um, Monash Indigenous Studies Center. So I'm looking after this uh, library guide. As you can see, there's heaps of resources that are relevant uh, if you are doing Indigenous um, research. Um, so lots of different databases and journal articles that you can um, access if you are Monash um, staff or student. The other thing is obviously the Indonesian Studies Library Guide. Um, so again, I'm looking after this guide. As you can see, again, heaps of different resources that we have. We have the um, uh, Indonesian Special Collection, which we keep um, on the lower, lower ground of um, the Matheson Library. Uh, if you ever need to access uh, all those special collections, please uh, email me and I would be able to uh, get the collection for uh, for you. We've got other um, uh, special collections uh, such as Southeast Asian Pamphlet Collection, Balai Pustaka Collection, uh, and um, different kind of uh, microfilms collection. Um, that's it from me. Uh, uh, enjoy the seminar. I'm going to hand it back to you, Sharon. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Reni. So I'm really excited today that we are joined by Ian McNiven, Professor in the Monash Indigenous Studies Centre uh, here at Monash University. Professor McNiven is an anthropological archaeologist who explores links between Aboriginal Australia and our closest neighbours in the Torres Strait, Papua New Guinea and Indonesia. Professor McNiven has researched and published extensively on the archaeology of Aboriginal use of the Great Barrier Reef, rock painting, shell work and fisheries, and has a primary focus on relationships between these areas before Europeans. Specifically, he has worked with Torres Strait Islander communities on the world's largest native title claim over the sea. And it is about the Torres Strait and its connection to Indonesia that we will hear more about today. Torres Strait Islanders have been positioned at an international crossroads at the nexus between uh, New Guinea Melanesian uh, to the north and east, the Aboriginal Australian world to the south, and the Indonesian world to the west. And over the past very many years, links between Indonesians and Torres Strait Islanders have grown as cultural processes in both regions uh, have intensified. 
So without further ado, I would like to invite Professor McNiven to talk to us on the topic Beyond the Setting Sun, Indonesian Cultural Influences in the Torres Strait of Northeastern, um, um, sorry, Northeastern Australia. Um, thank you, Ian. Uh, thank you, Sharon, for your, that nice introduction there. And, uh, and, and thank you uh, um, to the Monash uh, Indonesian Centre for the, for the kind invitation to present this talk to you today. It's, uh, it's something a little bit different. I don't normally uh, sort of speak in this sort of um, forum, but, uh, but I'm really looking forward to it because it's, there's been a few ideas that I've been sort of, uh, sort of throwing around in my, my head for a number of years. So I, I really sort of, uh, um, I'm really looking forward to seeing what sort of feedback I get. So I, I, I may talk for 30 minutes or so because I'd like to leave a bit of time for uh, discussion and, um, and then feedback. So I would very, very much sort of value that uh, expert feedback. So, um, can everybody see that? Is that working? Yeah, we okay. can. Great. So I've, I've titled my talk Beyond the Setting Sun and, and uh, um, the idea is there that, that the, these sort of uh, Indonesian cultural influences that are sort of heading east along the sort of southern coast of uh, Papua, West Papua, uh, towards uh, Torres Strait, that anybody along that sort of uh, pathway, and particularly Torres Strait Islanders, they would be looking where the sun goes down. That's where people are coming from. So, and for various groups uh, um, along that sort of southern coast of Papua, West Papua, and also uh, Torres Strait Islanders, that sort of uh, orientation of the sun, et cetera, has all sorts of important cosmological dimensions and, and, and uh, importance, which I won't go to uh, in today's talk, but, but that is another dimension that, that can be explored as well. So now a couple of weeks ago, I gave a presentation in uh, Lynette Russell's uh, Laureate uh, seminar program, uh, Global Encounters. And what I did there was um, I introduced uh, what I call the Coral Sea Cultural Interaction Sphere. And, and I've set this up to, so people have a, a much sort of broader understanding of the sorts of uh, international connections that, Indian, uh, that Indigenous Australians had with, with the outside world well, well, well before uh, Europeans and then the British came on the scene. So, of course, on the left there, you've got the, the famous uh, Macassan sort of uh, connections with Northern Australia there. Um, and, and, and then, of course, I've got the Coral Sea interaction sphere there, where people from Southern PNG through Torres Strait interacted with Aboriginal peoples of the northern part of Cape York Peninsula along that 2,000 kilometre um, sort of coastline. There, I've got a little extension there that you can see going off uh, here to, to the west, going up into Marinda Nim country there in, uh, in, 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 in Papua. Um, but what I want to talk to uh, today is something that, in fact, I didn't talk about uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and that's, in a sense, a broader extension of what I perhaps a little bit cheekily call the Arab USC cultural interaction sphere. But specifically, this is what I want to look at here. So movements of people and exchange systems, alliances, etc., along the southern coastline here. That's, that's the, the subject of, of today's talk. All sort of uh, broad areas that I want to look at. So first up, I'll look at um, Indonesian loan words uh, in, in Torres Strait, just a few examples. And then we'll explore whether that could be through the Kassan influence, everybody knows, or about the, the lesser known um, Serum Laut traders that are coming along that coastline as well. So we'll look at sort of historical evidence for that. And then I'll move into some new archeological evidence for Southeast Asian ceramics, uh, mainly in Torres Strait. And what that tells us, the new information that that sort of conveys. And then I'll finish up by looking at uh, just a, in a sense, setting up sort of future research or what uh, we may call the Southern Park and Spice Trade. Uh, and just how little information is known along what is essentially 1800 kilometres of coastline. So first up, the Indonesian loanwords in uh, Torres Strait. And I, I'm starting here with the work of uh, linguist Rod Mitchell, who's an authority on, uh, on the Western, lang Western central language of Torres Strait. And I've got a map here of Torres Strait. So obviously you've got uh, Cape York there, so the northern 
northeastern tip of mainland Australia, going across 150 kilometres of water, which is Torres Strait, to the southern coastline of uh, um, Papua New Guinea. Now, now Rod is an authority, like I say, on, particularly on the Western Central language, Kalalago Ya, um, and he's written this uh, a, a very large article in the memoirs of the Queensland Museum uh, from 2015, uh, where he elaborates on that language. But he's got an interesting section there where he discusses what he considers to be Indonesian loan words. So I'd like to start with that now, just so you know, with, when we're talking about the Western language, that's what we're talking about here, the Western Central language of Torres Strait. And in a minute, I'll talk about some loan words that uh, we've got in the eastern part of Torres Strait there with the eastern language. First up with the, the Western language. So here we are. This is the sort of the area we're talking about here, the Western central part of Torres Strait. And here's, here's three interesting words that, that Rod identifies. These are, these are Western Torres Strait uh, language terms in common use up there today. Um, and the first one is uh, kuda or cod, right? And a cod is an important closed or restricted discussion place, a ceremonial area. Um, and here's a, an illustration from the mid 19th century of a, of a ceremonial cod site on the island of Nagi in, uh, in, in the western part of uh, Torres Strait. And you can see it's got this uh, sort of telltale uh, sort of screen here which was used for uh, uh, ritual elaboration with all sorts of, uh, of objects. Um, and, and essentially the sorts of sort of secret activities that would go in behind that screen, predominantly by uh, initiated uh, men. Some COD sites were uh, uh, open for everybody. So men, women and, and children could, could go to them, but a lot of them were, had restricted access. Now, interestingly, Rod says that, that the word food or COD is actually uh, derived from the Malay term sort of koto or kota, which means sort of city, town, fortified place. And he also throws in the Javanese term there, kuta or city wall um, enclosure. So another term he, he, he identifies is kadal, which means crocodile. And, and crocodile is a very important totem, one of the key totems in Torres Strait. There are many people up there to, the, to this day who that is their, 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 their um, Titanic Association, clan association. And, and they had all sorts of expressions apart from just in terms of uh, so, social organization and, 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 and identity, um, but also expressed them with various types of material cultures, such as the very famous turtle shell mask, which Torres Strait Islanders uh, are, are famous for. This particular uh, effigy mask here is, is a crocodile. It's from the island of Nobiag in the western part of uh, Torres Strait. It's in the British Museum. It was collected by the missionary um, McFarlane from the London Missionary Society in, in the 19th century. It's, it's three metres long. So it's quite an extraordinary object. Uh, and interestingly, Rod says in Malay, uh, Kadal means um, lizard. And in Marquis, uh, we've got Kadalak there, well, it means lizard. So he believes that, uh, that, that that's the, the link there. The third one I've got here is the term Adi, which means in, 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 in Western Torres Strait language, like huge or great. And, and a, a very nice example of how that, that gets used um, in, in, in today's sort of uh, vernacular is in, in Torres Strait, is, 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 is illustrated here by Efren Barney, who was the uh, seventh chief of, uh, of, 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 of Mobiag. Uh, Ephraim passed, passed away in 2004. Uh, 2004, and, and as, an, as a, um, an expression of, of, the, of, of the great significance that uh, Ephraim had in Torres Strait uh, society, um, it, is, it is polite uh, to refer to him now as Adi Ephraim Bani, right? an, an acknowledgement of, of the particular use of that uh, term. So interestingly, in Malay, Adi means huge, great, almost in cultural significance. Um, this, according to Rod, uh, significant myth, legend, or a stone originating from a significant uh, myth, legend. I'll come back to these uh, later on in the talk. Okay, um, this is a quote from Rod. He said, the use of uh, these Malay um, examples, um, can't quite, sorry, can't see the presenter. <laughs> where it says 
sharing screen goes right over what I'm about to read out. Um, you know, the use of these Malay examples is, is, is not meant to imply that such potential loan words would be a priori from Malay. He says, such words are common to a variety of Indonesian languages and the actual origin will probably never be known. He then goes on to say in the same article from 2015, the Islanders, Torres Strait Islanders, had dealings with outsiders such as Macassans, who had been visiting the area for some centuries. And here he makes reference to the uh, Alfred Haddon, um, the famous Cambridge anthropologist who uh, headed up the uh, uh, equally famous Cambridge anthropological expedition to Torres Straits in 1898. And this is uh, from one of the volumes, one of the six volumes from that expedition. Um, in 1935, um, so make reference to that. So uh, now he says words which might be evidence of this sort of Macassan influence are those, for example, those three that I just uh, gave you there. Okay, but the key thing here is how Rod has used the Haddon reference because that's the key thing he's using. So. But there's, there's a slight problem here. Now, I'm actually going to give you the, the, the quote that he's referring to. So this is taken out of Haddon, right? And this is what Haddon says. It says, the Reverend McFarlane, the person who donated that um, Turtle Shell Master British Museum, the Reverend McFarlane informs me that the Torres Strait Islanders agree in stating that the Chinese who came in their junk seeking Tripang and working for lengthy periods among the Western Islands of Torres Strait were proper good men and gave them no trouble. Now, this is in marked contrast with the behavior of men of other nationalities. And here, Haddon is referring to South Sea Islander Bechtonair uh, operators in the mid 19th century. And he goes on to say, I have not come across any other references to Chinese coming to Torres Straits. Perhaps these fishermen were Malays. Okay, so it's interesting that in fact, he's identifying um, that the Chinese there. The other issue with the Macassan connection is that apart from what I've just read out to you, essentially there is no historical evidence for Macassan's tree pangers ever coming to Torres Strait. And there's also no archaeological evidence for Macassan's visiting Torres Strait either. And there's been extensive archaeological work over the last 30 or 40 years, numerous site surveys on dozens of islands, and nobody's found anything that even comes close to what we might call some sort of um, archaeological signature of Macassan tree pang activity in Torres Strait. And when I say archaeological evidence, here I'm referring to uh, the famous work um, that was initiated uh, on uh, Macassans visiting uh, the northern parts of uh, Australia, along the Northern Territory coast and the, and the Northern Western Australian coast. Of course, the work um, by Campbell McKnight nearly half a century ago. And here, um, Campbell, using things like this famous illustration here, um, uh, from Port Essington uh, in Northern Australia from, uh, uh, from 1845, showing you the, the very elaborate sort of factories and, and, and complexes that were set up uh, by, by the visitors on the Australia's Northern coastline. And you've got telltale things here, such as the, the boiling pans here with the elaborate fireplaces, and which uh, um, have sort of rock formations um, and, and Campbell, actually identified a number of sites that actually have these sort of sequences of uh, fireplaces for, for boiling up the, the tree pan. And you also get lots of um, artifacts as well, such as uh, Macassan sort of earthenware, ceramics, et, et, you know, et, et cetera. Um, nothing, nothing like this has ever been found in, uh, in, in, in Torres Strait. Okay. Now I want to look at uh, the eastern part of Torres Strait, the eastern language. And we've got two other examples here. And these examples have actually been known about for a long time. And we, and at, at least to the um, to, to Europeans and the British, this, this first became known when uh, Captain William Bly went through Torres Strait in 1792. And he stopped off on the eastern island of, of, of Arab. And then the Arab islanders came up to him. And the first thing they asked him for is uh, Torre Torre which it became very clear to Captain Bly that, that there are, the Torres Strait Islanders were asking for iron. Then uh, four years later, Matthew Flinders is also going through Torres Strait, stops off at the, uh, just to the south of Arab Island on the famous um, uh, Murray Island. Uh, again, Murray Islanders came out and they're asking for Torre Torre. So they're asking for iron. Uh, 
So, and even back then, uh, it was realised that these are loan words from from uh, from well from the uh, from the West um, in Indonesia. And interestingly, uh, there's two hypotheses, uh, more recent hypotheses, trying to account for the the Torah Torre terms in uh, been used by the Eastern Torres Strait Islanders. First the hypothesis was generated by Ian Hughes, who was an anthropologist slash archaeologist out of uh, ANU in the 1970s. He did his PhD um, on exchange systems through uh, the whole sort of island of New Guinea. And he wrote this uh, rather well-known monograph called New Guinea Stone Age Trade. Um, and in it, he, he, uh, Ian sort of refers to Toro Toro, and he believes rightly that it's derivative of an Indonesian language, but he says, but used by Macassan fishermen and traders and that in fact that they came in via the uh, the Gulf of Carpentaria. So we, he's taken what has already been known about Macassans coming to Northern Australia, coming across the Arnhem Land coast, coming down into the Gulf of Carpentaria, coming at least as far here as the Wesley Islands, but he's saying the Wesley Islands and then saying that perhaps there was an extension of Macassan activity coming up the west coast of Cape York Peninsula into Torres Strait, hence that's how we get the words Toro Toro. Now, like I say, there is no, it's a couple of problem, problems with that. The first is there's not a scrap of archaeological evidence for that. There's also no archaeological evidence um, along the west coast of Cape York for, for any uh, Macassan activity either. I would say, I wouldn't go as far as say it, it's not there, it's just that it hasn't been found. There hasn't been a lot of work done archaeologically along the coastline in contrast to the extensive work that's been done in um, Torres Strait. So, but the alternative hypothesis is by Pam Swaddling. In many ways, Pam Swaddling is the hero of this talk, who Pam in 1996 published this extraordinary book called Plumes from Paradise, where she goes into great detail documenting what in a sense is, uh, we're calling the Southern Pulp and Spice trade along the south coast of uh, PNG here. And Pam makes a lot of, again, this, this terms Toro Toro used by the Eastern uh, Torres Strait Islanders. And here she uh, goes in much more detail and, and, and points out that it is clearly derivative of the term for iron or knife used by Serum Laut traders over here in the eastern part of uh, Ireland, Indonesia. So you've got terms such as sort of Turi, Tuka, Turi, Turika or Turiko. So it's saying that's exactly how it's, um, it's derived. Um, and that not coming through Macassan influence, but coming along the south coast of Pap West Papua, Papua in Niger into Torres Strait. And I believe that um, Pam basically is, is, is on the money here. So just, even though the, the, the evidence is, is not definitive, all the uh, circumstantial evidence is certainly leading to this particular hypothesis. So if you haven't sort of read this book, I highly recommend it. I, I believe it's just been republished by the University of Sydney. So it's now more available. All right. So according to uh, Pam in her book, she says, the story of, of Serum Laut traders changed with the arrival in Indonesia of the Dutch and the VOC in 1602. Now, critically, in 1621, the Dutch attacked and subjugated the people of Banda to take control of the Indonesian Spice Islands trade system. And as a result, many Bandanese traders subsequently moved to the, to the, to the um, east to the nearby Serum Laut Islands and expanded the local inter-island trade system in, to include Southwest New Guinea. And here they traded iron, textiles, beads, etc., cetera, for Masai, which is a, a, a well-known scented bark, but also uh, Damar, which is a scented resin that is used for, uh, for fire torches, um, etc. So two key products here that are found um, on the lowlands of the uh, southern part of Papua, West Papua through here, and, but also going into the Transfly area here, adjacent to Torres Strait. So, so Pam's argument is that's what's leading to this trade system coming along here, out of uh, Ireland, uh, Indonesia, along the south coast, to exploit 
these um, Masoy and Dana and a range of other products as well, but particularly those two, which gets them as far as Torres Strait and hence the, uh, the, the loan words that, that we're picking up. Okay, so just sort of looking at that, uh, we tabulate that information, this paper looks a little bit more sort of confusing than it really is, it is quite simple. So what I've done here is that on the left-hand side, I've, I've, uh, I have different centuries, so um, starting with sort of before sort of the 1300, but then going to the 1300s, 1400s, et cetera. And the box in yellow is the, is the period that, uh, um, that sort of takes in what uh, Pam was talking about with the ceremonial out traders and maybe just a little bit before uh, as well. So, but, but in terms of the evidence, the historical evidence for this activity, if we start with Torres Strait, you can see we have nothing here for all these centuries until you get uh, what Captain Bly and Captain Flinders identified with the Eastern Islanders with uh, Torres Strait. So it, it's, very, it's very recent in terms of the sort of longer sort of history, right? If we look at historical evidence, particularly sort of Spanish and Dutch records uh, for, uh, for, for traders coming along, Sarum Lake traders coming along the South Coast, we have a little bit more information a little bit earlier. Now, Pam points out that in fact, it, that there's a Javanese poem from 1385 that probably does mention what appears to be the South Coast of, uh, of, of the Bird's Head area there of, uh, of, of, of West Papua. But it's not until you get into the sort of 1500s that you start getting some little sort of uh, inklings and records that maybe the Bananese traders and Sermalat traders were moving into that south coast part of uh, Papa. And I've got a question mark there because it's, it's not definitive, but there's sort of hints of it. The first real sort of solid evidence we get for it is with uh, Spanish and Dutch records and the Spanish like Torres, like the Torres expedition, they saw Chinese ceramics and metal on the south coast. The Dutch actually in the 1600s actually saw um, uh, actually saw serum lab traders with iron, etc., on, on that south coast. Moving into the 1700s, the, the historical record, at least the available one, here's the sort of drop off. Um, and then you pick up in the sort of the 1800s in the 19th century, where the Dutch are well and truly making all sorts of interesting observations of serum lab traders uh, along that south coast of, uh, of, of Papua. So, sort of tantalizing hints there. Now, if you add in here that the archaeological evidence, this is what Pam had to, to go by. In terms of Torres Strait, absolutely nothing to help back up her argument. If there were, at the time that Pam wrote the book, um, there, there was nothing there. The only thing she could make reference to actually was a little bit before what she's saying is the, when the, uh, the Serum Lab traders start really, that trade system really starts sort of kicking in. It's actually from the 15th century and it's excavations that were done um, in the sort of southern bird's head area there at uh, Beryl uh, Bay, where um, some excavations of burial sites revealed a series of uh, Chinese plates, such as one illustrated there on, on the right, which were dated to, the, that dated to the 15th century, suggesting a very early sort of Chinese um, influence there. But after that, nothing. So, Unfortunately, the archaeology didn't really help Pam a, a great deal. Then we have this information. This is work that sort of came out of archaeological research that I was doing in the western part of uh, Torres Strait, where I found a, a series of uh, sherds, which uh, looked like they were Southeast Asian wares. I'm not very good at identifying those sorts of uh, ceramics. Um, and it was very difficult to date them because they were just small pieces. Um, not very diagnostic in terms of their form or the, or the decorative conventions that were on those uh, ceramics. That's why I linked up with Peter Gray from the University of New England. And Peter has a, is trying to amass a very large database of, of the chemical fingerprints of Southeast Asian ceramics. So this is based on doing elemental analysis of, 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 known, uh, of ceramics of known age and looking at the chemical signature. And then if you find a small piece of small shirt, you do the chemical signature of that, then you can relate it back to his database, his known data database, and it'll give you an age for the ceramics, right? The way he's got um, some of the dating on these ceramics is actually the focus on dated ship, shipwreck ceramics that have a very sort of like a very narrow sort of uh, chronological time frame. 
So that's how you build up your database. So <clears throat> I sent a whole series of shirts to Peter, and he came back with some rather interesting results, and they're documented in that paper. So like I say, the PAM didn't have access to this. The first one is this little tiny piece here. This little piece of uh, stoneware, it's a, little, it's a piece of cream stoneware that has this sort of browny glassy glaze on the surface. That shirt is literally the size of the end of my little finger. It is tiny. Under normal circumstances, you could do archaeologically do nothing with this. However, that is more than big enough for Peter to get a chemical signature uh, from it. He got a chemical signature from it, um, and it, it, the nearest match he got was with southern Chinese ceramics from um, the 1500s, so from the 16th century. It was found on the island of Mobiag, about two metres under the surface, um, from an excavation that I did back in 2005. And uh, that, is, that is by far the earliest evidence that we have for any sort of uh, Southeast Asian influence in Torres Strait. And in fact, I believe that it would be the earliest evidence we have for any Chinese influence in Australia full stop using this, this, this new technique. Peter also looked at um, some other Asian ceramics that I found on, uh, on another site, and he identified those again using this chemical signature technique. Those are examples of uh, Thai ceramics and also uh, Burmese ceramics, and they, and they date to the, uh, to the 19th century, so much more recent. Okay, so now I want to uh, take the Thai and the Burmese ceramics, and just give you a little bit more information about where I found those. These were found on the surface of a ceremonial site, uh, interestingly referred to as a cod or a Buddha site, on the island of Pulu in the western part of Torres Strait. So here's Pulu here. It's next to the island of Mobiag. Mobiag is where I found that little tiny uh, piece of Chinese ceramic. So this is sort of right next door. This is uh, a, a ceremonial site as seen by Alfred Haddon, that famous anthropologist I talked about at the beginning of the talk. He, he did a sketch of the site in 1898, and the site has not changed one bit since Haddon was there over a century ago. The reason being that this is one of the most sacred and important places of the Mobiag people. Pulu, nobody lives on Pulu. It's a ceremonial sacred island. We were given very special permission to go there and do the work on, the, on, on this site. The community wanted to know more about, it, about, about its history. Um, so there was a, open access that, uh, that we were allowed to go there. And this is where, the, and on the surface of this site, we found these sherds. This is that same sort of drawing there of this particular feature. There's a stone arrangement with uh, infilled with all dugong bones. That's what it looks like today. It's the same stone features there, granite sort of little. Uh, standing stones and the remains of all these dugong bones. And this Thai shirt was just, was just a little bit off where the photograph is there. It was found on the, literally just sitting on the surface and just back a little bit this way again, just out of frame was this Burmese uh, shirt sitting on the surface of this ceremonial site referred to as a, as a pod or kuda. All right, let's go back to these three terms that I started the talk with. These Indonesian loan words, Malay loan words in Indonesia, according to Rod, linguist Rod, Rod Mitchell. So I've already said that it's interesting. Here we have Southeast Asian ceramics on the surface of a ceremonial site referred to uh, by the local community. The generic term is cod or, or uh, kuda, so in, in the local language. And that's what it's referred to today. But Rod's saying that this is actually a, a loan word for Indonesia. Interestingly, we've got Asian ceramics on the surface. But it gets more interesting on this side. At this location here is the fireplace um, identified here in the photograph taken by Haddon in 1898. This is the fireplace of the Kadal clan, of the crocodile clan, right here. And there's other uh, totem clan fireplaces around here, but Kadal is well and truly represented at this site. Then we go to Ardi. You can just see it here. The two little standing stones. This is what it, it is here. More of these pieces of granite and these large trumpet shells. This, this is a shrine. The name of the shrine is Ardi. So this ceremonial site has these three 
Indonesian uh, loan word, Malay loan words that, that, that are uh, inscribed into the ceremonial site. You have the generic name for the site. You have the Adi Shrine, which is one of the most sacred shrines actually at the ceremonial site complex. And then you have the Kadal Totemic fireplace here as well. All of this, all of this coming together with Asian ceramics on, on the surface in the central western part of Torres Strait. Okay, so interesting, interest, interestingly, archaeologically, what we have really is archaeological evidence for these early uh, Indonesian, uh, what we might call spice trade influences um, along the southern coast of Papua, West Papua. But the archaeological evidence is actually at either end of 1800 kilometres of coastline. So we've got what well, we have in Torres Strait, but that little tiny piece there, to the Chinese from the 1500s. We've got the Thai Burmese wares from the 1800s, 19th century. Then we go across here to the Chinese plates dating to the 15th century from that burial there in Beral Bay. But nothing, nothing has been documented archaeologically along this entire 1800 kilometres of coastline to join up these, these two dots to better understand these sort of Indonesian influences um, and, and trading relationships with communities along that southern coast there. And this is in a sense is where I'd sort of like to sort of end the talk, but really as a more of a platform to sort of launch things really. Um, clearly we, we, we need to, uh, if we want to understand this whole sort of connection, um, between Indonesia and the southern part of uh, West Papua coming into well, what in the sense is the northeastern tip of Australia. We need to document what, I mean, could give this a number of names, but I'm just calling for the purposes of this paper, the southern Papua and spice trade. And really to understand the other pre-cooked trading relationship that linked Indonesia and Australia. We know all about, we know a lot about, we've got a lot to learn um, about the Macassans, sort of trading relationships with Aboriginal people here in Northern Territory and WA. But here we have another uh, extraordinary uh, exchange sort of relationships that, are, that, and that connected Indonesia with the northeastern tip of Australia via the south coast of Papua. Papua. Obviously any sort of research that, uh, that would be done here would be a joint research in initiative between Indonesian and Australian scholars. And the other thing that we would need to do, and I hopefully I've shown this with this talk, is that we'd need to expand and integrate both historical and archaeological evidence for this southern uh, Papuan coast to bring these two different types of information together to flesh out the, uh, the story. So because neither one of them, archaeological nor um, the historical, can do the full story itself, we need to join the, the two together to, to flesh out the, the, this picture. But, I like to say, it's sitting there, 1,800, 1800 uh, kilometres of coastline, of which we know very little in terms of what we might call the southern part and spice trade. But wouldn't it be nice that we, perhaps we could do a lot more to uh, better understand the connections between um, our two countries? So I might just leave it at that. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Ian. Um, incredibly interesting and it's such a small world Campbell McKnight was my honours um, supervisor and he used to show all of these slides from his field work and I really really wanted to be an archaeologist but Launceston didn't offer that so um, I didn't but my, my daughter now wants to be an archaeologist so I'm certainly going to push her uh, towards that. Great daughter. What, a, what a great they could, they could team up <laughs> um, and also really exciting opportunities as Monash is now opening its campus in in Jakarta, those uh, collaborations uh, hopefully will, will be even easier. So that's a great call out to, to researchers um, to collaborate in that space. So I would love to open it up to questions. And I saw one pop up from uh, Margaret. Margaret, do you want to tilt your camera up so we can see your fabulous face? It's pointed pointed down and I'll, I'll read out. There you go. Gorgeous. Um, I'll read out your, your question um, for you. So uh, this is from Margaret for Ian. Is the uh, metal fragment you labelled Thai a fragment of a Dong Son drum like the fragments found in many parts of uh, Indonesia and Southeast Asia? Sorry, I've got um, loud birds around me. I'll just mute when I'm not talking. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Margaret. Um, uh, I, I, wish it, I wish it was, but no, it, it, it's ceramic. So... Um, but, but uh, we haven't actually found any early metal 
in uh, Torres Strait. Um, that could be a preservation thing. They're pretty brutal, those uh, sediments up there for being in such a, a sort of salt water country up there uh, for preserving uh, metal. But um, there's also copper, there's also brass as well, which would survive. So uh, we haven't found anything yet, um, but, it, but we'll keep looking. Great, great. So do feel free to write your questions down or we could also um, try and you can just speak if that is easier for you. You can just yell out uh, if you'd like to or raise your hand and we'll uh, try and um, see you. So I can see one here from Paul Thomas that I'll just uh, read out. Are there oral traditions in the Torres Strait Island of travellers from the far west who are significantly different from themselves? Uh, yeah, that, 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 that is the obvious question, isn't it? Um, nothing that I've come across so far, no. So interestingly, um, with that coral sea interaction sphere that I was talking about with Torres Strait Islanders going down the sort of the east coast of Cape York, there's all sorts of oral histories of people doing that over hundreds of years. So that, that is very strong. Um, and that is well documented in the native title uh, sea claim. But uh, interestingly, no, there's... Um, the, the only thing that people really talk about um, in terms of oral histories of, of some sort of Western connection coming from, uh, from, from Papua um, and, and uh, Indonesia is with the Marinda Nim who used to come down on their annual headhunting raids into the Trans Fly and the northern part of Torres Strait. And there they were, they were known as, not, not the Marinda Nim, but by uh, the term Tugeri. And even, even though that hasn't happened for a long time, um, I've spoken to old people in, in, in Torres Strait over the years that if you mention that word to Gary, people talk in hushed tones about it. Such was the dread that they had of the of the of the Marin Nim sort of coming in. But um, interestingly, that it looks like the Marin Nim got access to uh, brass sort of imitation stone uh, headed clubs that uh, they look like they're of uh, of Chinese manufacture. They could only be date to the uh, to the 19th century we're not too sure um but exa an example of one of those has been found in torres strait probably came in with a head hunting uh, expedition another one has also been found in the Transfly area in that southwest corner of uh papua new guinea but again that that is probably 19th century and it's probably got to do with chinese with the well-documented chinese traders in that area but in terms of the serum layout connection no i haven't heard anything but um i would never say never with that sort of thing until you've spoken to a lot more people so that a perfect question yeah great great um so do feel free to call out if you have a question or raise your um hand maybe while others are just thinking um i could just ask about kind of a pragmatic question what was the navigation like how were people traveling is there any what kind of evidence is available to show how people were were traveling around uh, obviously you've got uh, some quite extraordinary uh, uh, ships and vessels coming out of uh, eastern Indonesia there which would easily sort of get across to the south coast of West Papua there um, and then it's just a case of just cruising along the uh, the, the coastline so but, but some of those waters I mean you've got to know what you're doing some of those waters can get pretty rough so, and, and certainly like even when the Marinda and Nim were coming into uh, Torres Strait into that trans fly area in, in their canoes, they really hugged the coast because uh, yeah, those waters can get very rough. And in fact, that's why Torres Strait Islanders and their big sea going vessels, they liked meeting the Marinda Nim at sea. If they saw them coming, they would quickly get in their vessels and meet them at sea because then they would have, have the upper hand. So. Oh. And there are actually oral histories of battle places like in the sea, so in Torres Strait. So, wow, wow. And I, I guess it's just men traveling, right? There are no, there's no evidence that, that women were ever, or is there maybe? Um, I haven't read anything on that, but um, I, I would be careful about yeah, drawing sort of firm conclusions from that. So, uh, I mean, one of the things I'd really like it would be interesting to see is that we have tantalizing hits, hints from the VOC records, Dutch records, of some of their explorations along that south coast and some of the documentation of, of what they saw. I think it would be interesting to sort of explore a little bit more depth about 
anything was observed that may sort of elaborate a little bit on that because people were going for months on end and some of these expeditions when people did that they would actually take like entire families because you have to in a sense reproduce your domestic setup and interestingly when the Marinda Nim came in, into uh crossed over into the trans fly into torrent and also the northern part of torres strait on these head down, head hunting expeditions they would do that for like two and three months and literally hundreds of people would come on those expeditions including women and children because you still have that sort of that uh, sort of gender division of, of labor and particularly with fruit preparation etc et so in a sense you sort of you, you bring your society with you, particularly if you're going for many months. So like, like, um, like I say, even though the records seem to suggest it's more of a, of a male activity, I think it certainly would be very interesting to explore that in a little bit more depth. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And any superstitions or, you know, this idea of actually a functioning unit is the one that you need to be traveling with and whether any of the exchanges went, you know, beyond kind of, you know, iron and pottery and things to actually more of a, you know, a human capital exchange as we go. Uh, we've got another question. Reni, would you like to read it out? Yeah, so another question is from Aline Scott Maxwell. Are there any Malay or Indonesian connections through the pearling trade or was, was that later, the pearl, pearl trade? Um, you do get, I mean, the, the pearling industry in Torres Strait Islands really sort of takes off, what, in the late sort of 1860s, but, but really sort of, yeah, in the 1870s. Um, I mean, everybody is coming in for that. So lots of people from Southeast Asia, you know, Philippines, everywhere. So um, also throughout sort of the South Pacific as well. So, um, and that's certainly one of the things that linguists like Rod are on the lookout for to make to see whether if some of these line words came out of the pearling sort of era. But uh, the, the, the general feeling is, well, two things. One, um, the, the sorts of terms that they're using, they're so profound, such as sort of, uh, like the use of like the, the term for the for the key ceremonial site in Western Torres Strait, like Kodal, Kodal, uh, sorry, and uh, Kuda, um, the term Adi, which is like you know the most sort of prestigious term that can be used for somebody. That these are deep terms. These these have been in the community for a long time. Then of course you have the obvious one with the Eastern language with Torre Torre. That is that is long. That is well before the maritime industries. Uh, the pearling industry starts in um, Torres Strait. So, thank you. Uh, and another question. Thank you, Margaret. Are there any connections between Sabah and the North Australian coast? I think Aaron Corn has found some connections. Uh, well, presumably, as an extension, perhaps of the of that whole sort of tree pang Macassan sort of trading system. So. Um, but whether there's other dimensions to it, that I don't know, but it certainly wouldn't surprise me. So, I mean, this is, like I say, it's, you've got this, the Arafura sort of cultural interaction sphere. I mean, it's on for young and old up there. So, and it, is, it has no doubt it has many complex dimensions, which we're only just scratching the surface of, no, of knowing. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Any other questions? Do feel free to just um, blurt them out, raise your hand, type them in. Otherwise, I can just ask questions all day. Yes, 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 Steve. Do I can? Yeah. Uh, you just on mute. Ah. See. Ah. Yeah, just unmute yourself. It's just on the bottom left. Let me try to do it for her. Makasi. Oh, yeah. Um, I already asked her to unmute, but I'm not sure uh, why. Ah, uh, here we go. Silakan, Bu. Silakan. Ah, okay, yeah. Terima kasih. I was just wondering the influence of the language. Uh, the Makassans uh, went uh, to the North Australia tip there, and uh, I've been uh, in, informed that uh, the Indonesian language has sort of abs absorbed or vice versa absorbed the Aboriginal language. 
Um, absolutely. I mean, yeah, they, these sort of exchanges are always two way, aren't they? It's never one way. Yeah. You know, because exchange relationships are social relationships, and there's That's those right. bonds that are, mm. that are that are that are um, uh, sort of produced out of those sort of exchange relationships. It's not just a purely economic thing. It's uh, you trade with the people who you have a relationship with, so you have to invest in that relationship. And often, yeah, exchanging words and terms um, is is a critical dimension of mm. that. Um, uh, and yeah, that, that is my understanding, certainly like with the Macassans, that uh, that there was that, that there are Aboriginal words that mm. are back in uh, Macassar. Um, yeah. So. But I think sort of Lynette Russell with her laureate program, that's one of the things that she'll be sort of looking at as well, trying to sort of, uh, sort of uh, make more sort of uh, insights into that. So we're all looking forward to that. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. And Lynn's just put here, uh, Lynette's just put here that uh, both Paul Thomas and Nick Evans, uh, among others, have studied these. Uh, oh, right. Yeah, thanks, Lynette. Other questions? Oh, did we get the uh, Ibu Margaret's uh, question? Is there a story about links with Thailand or only with Thai ceramics? That's the question. Yeah, at the moment, it's only the Thai ceramics. So, mm -hmm. and whether that, whether that is actually a link with, like a direct link with Thailand, or, or I mean, my feeling is it's more that Thai ceramics have come into the Indonesian exchange system, um, and then sort of through a series of hands it end up in uh, Torres Strait. So, yeah, those those pieces of pottery that I've found, I think, have been handled by a lot of different people. And been in a lot of different boats before they got there. How do you know they're Thai? Um, based on the chemical fingerprint, mm. and which is um, uh, based on the work that Peter Grave has done. So, looking at shipwrecks, shipwreck ceramics. So, where you know that the from the from the shipwreck and from the because you have the whole vessel, um, you know exactly where they're, they're from such as Swankalock, et, et, et cetera. Um, so we can't do that because we don't only have sort of smaller pieces, but the chemical fingerprint is, um, is, is apparently, according to Peter, is, is very distinct. It's from, it's from, the, it's from clays from Thailand. Mm. But, but the shipwreck um, routes would have been further west, yeah? Uh, certainly the main one, yes. But what we're, what we're thinking is that uh, so the exchange systems in Indonesia that sort of linked up with uh, Thailand or coming down with sort of the Chinese, so you would have had Thai ceramics circulating in, in Indonesia. Uh, eventually, they get to uh, to the Seram layer, and then sort of then they get taken along the south coast of uh, of, of of West Papua there. So and end up in on a ceremonial site in Western Torres Strait. Quite a journey. <laughs> Other questions? If, if I could, um, Sharon, if I could make a, uh, a brief comment about um, some Dutch historical records of the early years of the Dutch administration, uh, the establishment of Dutch administrative posts in Fak Fak and Kainama in the early years of the 20th century. On the, on the basis of the early memory van Overgave and first reports by controllers and Bastur's assistants in those, those two areas where they, clear, they had detailed documentation of the Saram Laut trading networks, which went directly to Saram Laut and as far as the Ambonese Islands in one direction and down to Banda in the other. And that trading network seems to have survived and operated nearly independently of the uh, clove and nutmeg uh, monopolies, which um, established by the VOC and continued into the last decades of the uh, uh, of the nineteenth century, uh, but interestingly, the the, the early uh, accounts of the structure of local societies in Fak Fak and Kainama revealed um, uh, an administrative you know, village level administrative structure which was remarkably the same as in Muslim villages in the Ambonese Islands and the south and southwest coast uh, of Saram. And, they all, and the, the Dutch officials also noted 
a very considerable intermarriage, particularly at uh, village leader, village elite level, uh, between local leaders in southwest Papua uh, and those in Saram Laut and further into the Ambanese Islands. Uh, and, and estimates of you know, 25, 30 percent of local populations that had already converted to Islam uh, had done so uh, for a century or more. Thank you, Pat. Thank you. Mm. Any other questions? Um, there's a question from Lynette, but I'm not sure whether that's in relation to the, uh, to, um, to the previous question. Did you see that, Sharon? Is there any other evidence such as botanical or physical or genetic? Good evidence of shipwrecks near the Wellesley and Gullywing Coop. Well, nothing yet. <laughs> yeah. We need some divers to yeah head yeah. out. Yeah. Um, but, but, but I, I think that... lines of evidence. So that's absolutely yes. There's there's we have to sort of uh, I mean these sorts of connections. We have to really sort of think sometimes a little bit outside the box. I think mm. so and and look at these other um, sort of uh, material expressions of of connections, whether it. Is expressed in people's genes, or whether it's expressed in uh, um, botanics, etc. Et so, yeah, there's there's all sorts of uh, indirect ways of, of of looking at this. Mm. Uh, we have to put our thinking caps on. I think I think a bit yeah. more deeply. Yeah. So what we're all doing. So. Yes, and and especially I don't know if you had any hypotheses about you know that missing 1,800 kilometres. Is that just because the research hasn't been done yet or do you think there's some other reason that you know we just have these kind of two centers of evidence um i mean there's tantalizing hints along that uh 1800 kilometers and there are certainly dutch records for a few little spots along that well in fact like richard just said i mean if you go sort of more towards the west end of that there's considerable dutch um records increasing as you come sort of through time um but um but, but it's more sort of as you come sort of towards um the, the, the sort of the eastern end towards Torres Strait where there's all it appears to be very few records um but I think again it, it it's it's the archaeology that that may really help us so and apart from sort of archaeological work done on the bird's head I'm unaware of I'm unaware of any ex, that yellow line that I had there I'm unaware of any publications on any archaeological excavations for that entire 1800 kilometers of coastline. Wow, I mean, you that's got a, a real you cool but collaborative research. Yeah. There must be one of the longest stretches of coastline on the planet that has had no archaeological work done. I mean, literally, it's quite extraordinary. So, but it's such an interesting story. It is, it is, absolutely. I mean, just, you know, the thought of how exciting that'll be for, you know, collaborative research projects to go and go and explore that, including our, you know, up and coming archaeologists, uh, mm. if they, they <laughs> end up being that. Well, that has brought us um, up to time. That was incredibly interesting. And I just love hearing about all of these connections and this world, you know, that is, that is uh, quite intimately interwoven uh, and we just don't hear enough about that particularly you know uh, in contemporary Australia so so that was just uh, wonderful so thank you so much professor and also I just want to uh, thank all of you for joining us today and and for listening and as always a big shout out to Lauren who was just behind the scenes doing uh, all this incredible work to bring uh, this to us today and also Anita and Rennie especially for their help so please do join us next month for our Monash Indonesia seminar series and so until then semoga sehat and sampai jumpa lagi Terima kasih semua. Bye.